Hey, New Beginnings, thank you so much for joining us for church today. We just want to invite you to worship with us wherever you are right now as we just give God all the praise and all the glory that he is due. We're so thankful for his love, his grace, and his mercy to us. So join with us as we worship today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes will not perish they shall have eternal Church, 
let's choose right now in this moment to walk and live in that freedom that he freely gives us.
all around us, God, you're working and you're moving. You're acting on our behalf, God. You're fighting for us. Not for one moment have you left us alone or forgotten about us. But God, we're right here in the palm of your hands and you're working when we don't see it. You we don't feel it. We don't know what's going on. We can trust that you're working things out, that you're moving on our behalf, God. And we praise you, Lord.
praise you, we magnify you, we glorify your name, God. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We're so glad that you are here. Let's get our hearts ready now to receive the word. Well, good morning, New Beginnings family. Thank you for joining us today for Virtual New Beginning. And it is another amazing Sunday. But I first want to say thank you from our family and all of our staff for your expressions of love and appreciation and your words of encouragement last week for pastor appreciation. Let me just tell you, we love being your pastors. And although this year has been like no other, we are believing that the church will continue to grow and be effective for the kingdom of God. Now, this last week, I was listening to a pastor friend of mine. I was listening to his podcast, and this message he preached really captured my heart. And he titled it, Why Church? And he was kind of talking about reopening and makes us ask, when are we going to reopen? What does that look like? And I begin to question, who's coming back? And 2020 has been a lot of things, but I think the best way to describe it is this is a year of disruption. And that's caused me to re-examine my priority and the things that I value. In fact, this week I read a book by Patrick Lencioni called The Motive. And they addresses the motivation of the heart and why there are leaders leading for the wrong reason. So I began praying and searching my heart for what my motivation for being a pastor is. Now, there are a lot of great things about being a pastor, but there are just as many frustrating things that come with being a pastor. But one good thing that is a reason for being a pastor has to be the calling to love people and shepherd them to the Father. That essentially is leading people to Jesus. And when we do that, it's not about a title, whether it's reverend or bishop or senior pastor. But let me just tell you, for the Los Angeles Dodgers, it is all about the World Series title. Woo! It's also not about the stage or the lights. Because truthfully, sometimes it's hard to come up with messages every week after week after week and expecting to hit a grand slam. But most people expect it. Even when you hit a, a solo home run, they say, why did you waste that? It's also not about the pay. Now, we're blessed, and I'm not complaining at all, but most pastors don't get into the ministry for the salary packages or for the benefits. Why do we do it? Because it's about God's people. And I tell new ministers all the time that if you don't like people, the ministry will eat you alive. In fact, there's even a joke that we say as pastors that says, if it weren't for the people, the ministry would be amazing. But it's about the people, and without the people, there would be no ministry. But it's caused me to think about the effect that this disruption is having on the church. Not the building, but the people that make up the church. And this is the perfect opportunity to ask ourselves, why do we do the things that we do? Or to even go deeper, like my friend said, why church? Or what was God's initial motive for the church? And as we think about why do we do what we do, those are called our habits or our culture that we've established. And so why do we have church on Sunday when Saturday was the traditional Sabbath as the last day of the week. Just look at your calendar. And why don't people dress up for church like they used to, wearing their Sunday best? Or you might ask, why do we serve coffee and donuts at church? Because is that what church is really about? How come we don't have three-hour services like I remember as a kid going to? Or church on Sunday evening, or Wednesday evening, or Sunday school before Sunday morning service? Some would say because we're too busy. I would say that our schedules had filled up with other things. And I do know that church culture has changed dramatically since I've been in ministry. If we look at statistics from the Barna Research Group. They tell us that the average church attender attends 13 services a year. So that's one service per month plus Christmas as a bonus. And since COVID, our culture has had to adjust even greater. And I'll be honest with you, that it's been nice having all of the service elements done before Sunday, and being able to jump online and engage with other church people and or either other churches, watching my friends who pastor. But my question is, is that sustainable? You see, for some, they don't even get out of bed to watch service. But there's nothing wrong with that. 
but I have a fear that people are going to show up in their PJs when we get back to having in-person services. And I recently had someone ask me, when are things going to get back to normal, Pastor Sean? Back to our regular church gathering? Well, first off, I don't have an answer. Secondly, what if God wants it to look different? In fact, there are some churches in our state and in our surrounding states that they're back to their regular scheduled broadcast. They're doing in-person services. But I also know some that don't know when or what it will look like when they start that journey again. Just like us, I don't know what that's going to look like. But we are trying to follow our governor's orders within reason and also continue to meet the spiritual needs of our people. We are the church. I think a big question is to evaluate is, what is my commitment to the church? And why? Now I'm asking as your pastor because I believe that we need to have a conviction about what we are a part of. A recent Barna study said that one in three regular church attenders hasn't attended at all. That's online or in person since COVID. And I think that there's a revelation through this COVID disruption that we must evaluate why we do church. So I began thinking about revelation, right? I was reminded of uh, uh, John on the island of Patmos and the letters that he wrote to the seven churches that were there. The first one that he writes is basically an instruction, but he says uh, in, in verse two of, of chapter three, he says, I know all the things that you do and I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know that you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. And you have discovered that they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. Now, John is encouraging them, but he also says, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. And then John eats each letter with a similar closing. Verse 7, he says, Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. We must listen and understand. And he says, To everyone who is victorious, I will give the fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Now, I'm sure as you read that or heard that, there were things that jumped out at you and maybe some that didn't jump out to others. That's called a conviction. So what has God convicted you of through just this simple passage I just read? Maybe you haven't worked as hard as you could have or should have. Maybe there's some conviction because you have no patience with people or things. Maybe you do tolerate evil people. Maybe you're one of those that calls yourself an apostle, but you're really not. Maybe you're a liar or a quitter. Maybe you've done multiple of these things and you're guilty and the conviction is sitting in of those things that we've done. Or possibly it's the Holy Spirit. And he's complaining that you don't love God or others as you used to. So I think that for each of us, there's some course correction that we might have to make. We might have to look at and make an evaluation. Now, there was a letter written to the other church in Ephesus, and there were six more churches and six more letters written to them. The church of Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Those are some fun names. Just try to say those names five times real quick. So I want to give you some homework this week because I don't have enough time in today's message, and it's good for you to read and study. I want to challenge you to go back and read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and then ask the Holy Spirit, what are the things in these letters applies to me? You see, because John wrote them to those churches, but he also wrote it to us as the church. But I want to close today by looking at the letter written to the church in Laodicea. Verse 15, John writes, I know all the things that you do, that you're neither hot nor cold, and I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Puh, nasty. You say, I'm rich. I have everything that I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold for me, gold that has been purified by fire, and then you will be rich. Also, buy white garments for me so that you will not be shamed by your nakedness and anoint your eyes so that you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. In verse 20, he wraps up, he says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal 
together as friends. So those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Again, John says, anyone who has ears must hear and listen to what the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. So we see here in John's letter from the Holy Spirit to the church in Laodicea that they had become lukewarm. And the rebuke is simply this, that God wants us either to be hot or to be cold. And let me just tell you, I can totally relate to that. It's kind of like my coffee. I either want it scolding hot where it burns your tongue and you can't taste anything for the rest of the day, or I want it so cold that it has ice crystals floating in and around it. But never, ever, ever give me room temperature coffee. So how do the things that we address to the churches apply to you? What John was saying to them, how does it apply to you? What would John be saying to you through the Holy Spirit? You see, you are the church. The building that we gather in is just a place for us to participate in worship and fellowship, and discipleship and evangelism. You see, you are a part of God's purpose or God's motive. What's your motive? We must understand God's motive. And if it weren't for you, the church wouldn't exist. So we must realize that when our purposes and God's purposes don't line up, that's when we get in trouble. When our purposes and God's purposes don't mesh together. But God's purposes, they are always eternal. And long before this planet was ever formed, God knew that this coronavirus would have an effect on humanity in 2020. So you might ask, what might be the motive or the purpose of COVID-19 for me? What if it's a wake-up call back to what our eternal purpose was supposed to be? To be the church. You see, many think that the church was planted in Acts chapter 1, but it was actually in Genesis 1 after God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 28 says, Then God blessed them and he said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and the animals that scurry along the ground. This is a command that God gives Adam and Eve. And he gives it to us as well. You see, he intended for them to grow and to multiply, to form a family. And that's one of the reasons why here at New Beginnings, we call each other family. We are truly part of God's big family. Later in Genesis 9, God commands Noah to multiply and fill the earth. In Genesis 12, God tells Abram that he's going to make him into a great nation. Then God changed Abram's name to Abraham. And that's where we get the song. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, because we are the church, and we have been commanded to multiply. And this happens simply in two ways. One, having kids, and I think it's funny because there are going to be lots of 2020 COVID kids. Parents locked up in the house, and they're having kids, making babies. And number two, that's reaching the lost. You see, Jesus says in Matthew 16, upon this rock, I will build my church. And Jesus is the cornerstone of that foundation, but you and I are a building block to the church. You see, we're a part of the story that began way at the beginning of creation. How cool is that? That God thought of you and he wanted you to be a part. That we get to be a part of the story of God's eternal purpose. And you and I, we have opportunities every day to be the salt and the light of Jesus to the lost, hurting, and confused world. You see, you and I, we can offer hope, we can offer healing, and we can offer the truth through Jesus. You see, but we get so busy with our motive and our purpose that we forget what God wants to do through us. Now, I don't know what the future of New Beginnings looks like. I don't know when we'll get back to regular service. We have some things in the work but what I do know is that when we follow God, he is always with us and he always works out things for our good. Even thinking about Pastor Derek from last week, he said that we need to be a church of encouragement, not a church of complainers and arguers and whiners and babies. So come on, church. If John were to write a letter to New Beginnings, what would it say? What would, have had that we, what would he say that we have done good at? What would he say that we are known for? And also, what would he say that we could do better at? What correction would he have for us? And I think we have to look at that scripture that says, anyone who has ears to hear, let him listen and understand what the Spirit is saying.
So I've been praying for you this week, knowing that this message was coming, but I want to pray over you right now. God's favor and God's blessing. I want us to really listen to what the Holy Spirit might be saying to us. God, we come before you today. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you included us in your story, that you included us in your purpose and your motive. God, we are your children and we were created in your image. And Lord, I pray right now for anyone who might be watching or listening to this service today. God, that maybe they don't have a right relationship with you. Maybe they've never asked you to come into their heart to forgive them of their sin. That God, right now, wherever they're at, you are there with them. And God, they can simply engage in that relationship by asking you to do that. So God, I ask right now, God, you know every person who's watching, every person who's listening, and God, you know exactly where they're at. And God, I believe that there are those that want a relationship with you. God, today, we encourage them. We lift them up. We pray for them today, God. God, that you would write their name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. God, that they would make you their Lord and their Savior. God, that they would serve you. But God, I pray for us today as a church, God, that we would feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, not the condemnation from man. God, the things that even that I said that they would not come from condemnation, but they would come from the conviction, God, that you've put upon my heart and my life as the pastor. God, that you would help me to lead this flock of believers, this group of apostles, God. It wouldn't just be a title, but God, it would be a purpose, God, to fulfill what you've called us to be. God, help us to be the church. God, and even though we may feel like we're scattered because we can't gather, God, we know that you are with us. God, we know that you're doing great things beyond what our physical eyes can see. So Holy Spirit, help us to hear what you want us to do. Help us to understand what it is so that we can be obedient and follow through with it. God, today, we thank you. We pray, God, that you would give us the motivation of your heart. God, not our motivation, but your motivation. God, I thank you for this church. God, I thank you for the things that you're doing, even without us fully understanding it. And God, we are careful to give you the thanks and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, church, for joining us today. I just want to encourage you uh, to chime in if you haven't already. If you want prayer, uh, our prayer partners are going to be doing a Zoom prayer call. And so you can look for the info. We'll have that posted up here in just a little bit. We love you so very much. God bless you. Have a great rest of your Sunday.